My name is Scott Chaloner and you are listening to the Leaders' Council podcast for the people who run the country and the people who keep the country running. As regular listeners of our programme will know very well, part of our mission here at the Leaders' Council is to bring you a variety of distinct perspectives on leadership and current affairs. And to this end, I am delighted to say that we're joined on today's show by Judith Clegg, a serial entrepreneur and founder of innovation agency Takeout, which helps organisations create new flagship products, services and profits. Um, Judith has been named as one of the top British women in technology and alongside Cher Chevalier, a world-renowned spiritual advisor, author and co-author of Meditations that launched Calm, iTunes app of the year 2017 and film producer. Uh, Judith also co-authored the book Compassion in Commerce and we'll probably be talking a little bit about that today as well. With new Prime Minister Rishi Sunak taking office after a chaotic and short-lived premiership by his predecessor Liz Truss and also a new monarch on the throne in King Charles III following the passing of Her Majesty the Queen, we are looking to hear from business leaders about what they believe the main priorities for the new government should be. So without further ado, uh, Judith, thank you for joining us on the programme and thank you also for taking the time to do this. It's a real pleasure for me to welcome you onto the show with us. Thank you so much for inviting me onto the podcast to talk about what Cher Chevalier, with whom I co-authored the book Compassion in Commerce, and I believe are the seven key points that the new government desperately needs to address. In other words, how do we become bold, brave, booming Britain when our country is currently in chaos? I think that's a fair assessment. Uh, chaos may actually be something of an understatement, to be fair. And uh, I guess the key thing that um, everyone is thinking about at the moment is that cost of living crisis. So to start there, um, what do you have to say on uh, the situation that we're currently facing on that front, Judith? Well, yes, as you may expect, our first point is on addressing the cost of living crisis that's causing suffering and distress to so many And to understand where we've ended up where we are, as a very insightful article in the Herald points out, a good source of reference is Norway, because the North Sea oil fields are geographically and equally divided between us. Norway's oil and gas industry is state-owned. Ours is privatised. And back in 2008, the chief economist at PwC estimated that if we'd invested our oil profits in a sovereign fund like Norway, it would then have been worth £450 billion. Others have said it could even be double that. Now, Norway is now in the top five most wealthy countries in the world per capita. Even using favourable measures, the UK might just make the top 20. The Norwegians have also transformed their home energy usage so that 98% of it is now provided by renewables. So whilst Norway invested profits, ours were used to keep oil and non-oil taxes lower. In 2020, the UK's total revenue from the North Sea was £0.2 billion. Norway's was £9 billion. And in 2015 to 2016, we were the only country that they operated in to give Shell and BP tax rebates. In those two years, Shell paid Norway £4.6 billion. We gave them £179 million back. How have governments got away with it? These are things that need to be in the public domain. And Conservative and successive governments since Thatcher got us into this mess. Yeah, so with the new government on the uh, uh, obviously in place now... Um, there's been obviously a lot made of the uh, the recent mini budget and uh, the reversal of the the tax cut agenda that Trust wanted to bring in. So this is something when we talk about energy security that certainly needs attention. So from your perspective, what do we need to do now with this? Well, point A, we agree with your previous guest, Dale Vince, that we need to stop allowing the price of gas to set the price of electricity. And government money spent on assisting the public with their rocketing bills should be paid for by a windfall tax on the £170 billion the oil and gas industry will make over two years of the crisis. It's worth mentioning that even the chief executive of Shell has said that oil and gas companies should be taxed to help the poorest in this regard. Point B, we should ensure that all of our energy comes from renewable sources. It will save money and will obviously help save the planet. 
energy accounts for about 60% of global greenhouse gas emissions. There should be a wide ranging scheme to help the public install solar panels with government accredited providers. Now, Labour and Conservatives have said they will do more on solar, but neither has announced a scheme like this. We need to assess and invest in other renewable energy sources too, such as wind, for which there was some positive news in the new budget, um, and things like geothermal. And you can even generate energy from sewage and grass. <coughs> Dale believes, and he's had this independently verified, that all of the UK's gas needs can be met by grass and that such a scheme could provide up to 160,000 jobs across the country. Point C, our energy should be under national ownership. National resources belong to and should be used for the good of all. Now, Labour's plans for a Great British Energy Company, if properly implemented, could be a good step in the right direction. And point D, universal basic income merits consideration. There have been some successful trials around the world that show it can improve health, life satisfaction and employment opportunities. And it could be given, for example, as 33% food vouchers, 33% utility credits and 34% as cash with child maintenance payments, obviously deducted. And of course, we should also be taking steps to conserve and use energy wisely, which brings us to point two. So on point two, using and conserving energy, uh, what can we uh, can we do to uh, sort of really take that forward? Well, our point two is fixing the mass waste crisis. We've become used to a throwaway society where precious resources mm. are squandered and we don't take care of or keep things for the long term. It wastes money and it's terrible for the environment. So what are some of the most pressing examples of sort of wastefulness in society today? We know that it exists, but sort of just to kind of point out where we're going wrong. Sure. Well, globally, only 8.6% of the economy is circular. So that's where things are more durable, reused, repaired and kept in circulation as long as possible. In Britain, we could save at least £100 billion if we stop wasting so much energy. So it's pretty obvious that the government must urgently start implementing energy efficiency initiatives for businesses and homes. And the two million tonnes of good to eat food that's wasted by the UK food industry annually would feed seven million British people for half a year. And in the new fashion film Slay that Cher is associate producer on, they reveal that producing one pair of leather shoes uses as much water as one person drinking the daily recommended amount for 10 years. We've got to stop this madness. That's a staggering statistic on the uh, the use of leather there and also on the uh, the sort of good to eat food that gets wasted by the uh, the food industry as well. Um, like I've, I'm quite aware, of course, that there have been some positive steps such as, you know, sort of like two good to go food sales that have come about recently. So there's a step in the right direction there in some form, I suppose. Uh, but in the fashion industry, just thinking of that s- incredible statistic that you've just shared with me, what should we be looking to, uh, to do there to really try and address that situation? Well, when it comes to fashion, the most sustainable garment is the one you're wearing. And it's great it's becoming increasingly cool not to buy new clothing. And the government should be encouraging manufacturers and retailers to help people look after their products and repair them or buy second hand. And what else should the government be looking to do here? Because I'm guessing that given we're sort of seeing a lot of uh, sort of uh, furor about sort of energy security and the need to shore it up in the short term, the key thing is that we don't sort of... uh, let us get bogged down in talk about you know sort of expanding North Sea oil and gas licenses um, bringing fracking back and then that sort of means that it sort of comes at the uh, the detriment of you know the long-term carbon goal I guess. Well linked to that another big waste issue is transitioning cars away from fossil fuels which we all know needs to be done mm-hmm. but the waste involved in scrapping existing cars to switch to electric which by the way, are turning out to be more expensive to run and and not as green as we perhaps thought, is completely unnecessary. Existing petrol and diesel cars can be converted to run on bioethanol and biodiesel. We could easily grow biofuels in this country via hemp, 
Forbes even ran a headline saying industrial hemp is the answer to petrochemical dependency. A fun fact is that Henry Ford made the very first supercar out of hemp. The hemp plastic he used was tested to be even stronger than steel and the car ran on hemp fuel too. That is really, really interesting because um, like I said, I've heard a lot about sort of Henry Ford's early innovations, but I didn't necessarily know that the first supercar was made out of hemp plastic and I suppose that's not a widely known at all fact is it and it's it's one of the sort of longest standing sort of crops on the planet so why is it that maybe we're not sort of cashing in on it like we should be? Well we should be I mean as you say hemp is actually one of the oldest and fastest growing crops on the planet it absorbs four times more CO2 than trees it can help in the fight against deforestation it regenerates soil It's one of the least wasteful crops on the planet because it doesn't need much water. It can be grown without pesticides. And almost all of the plant can be used to make over 25,000 types of products, including milk, food, fabric, paper, biodegradable plastic and hempcrete. So it's a win-win crop for the economy and the environment. And back in 1533, hemp was in such high demand to produce ropes, nets and sails that Henry VIII made it compulsory to be grown on all farms. So the government needs to start championing hemp and end the ridiculous regulation that makes it financially unviable for many producers to grow. It's quite staggering, isn't it, when you think that we kind of cottoned onto this centuries ago and now we've sort of moved away from that despite the incredible benefits there. So it'd be very interesting to kind of gauge over the years why that has happened. Um, but sort of moving on from that and kind of addressing the sort of wider point, which I think has certainly sort of bec- become something that people are more acutely aware of since the pandemic is, of course, the uh, the climate crisis. So I think it serves that we do that we do also talk about that. Yes, so uh, you're right. Our third point is the climate crisis. And as many people know, we have less than a decade to prevent the Earth from reaching the crucial 1.5 degrees centigrade warming limit. And that was outlined, of course, in the uh, the 2015 Paris Agreement. Um, And um, again, there was a lot of talk about that at the uh, the recent uh, COP26 uh, climate summit that the uh, the UK hosted. Um, But what are your thoughts on what the government has actually done on this so far? Are we progressing like we should be toward net zero by 2050? So what has the government committed to do to stop this? Not nearly enough. A key area where they've done next to nothing is animal agriculture, which is a leading cause of climate change, deforestation, biodiversity loss and water pollution. Their inaction is absolutely absurd given that an Oxford University study showed that eliminating meat and dairy is probably the single biggest way to reduce your impact on the planet. They need to act immediately to encourage whole food, plant-based diets. And how can we go about doing that? Because I guess trying to kind of implement that level of change overnight to sort of consumer habits let's say that's going to be something that's really difficult so i suppose does that kind of have to be a gradual change do you think well point a we need to encourage the british public and companies in this regard most supermarkets have their own brand of plant-based foods and many of them are committed to selling them at very affordable prices but there's so much more that could be done point b we need a new generation of organic growers of british fruit and vegetables And point C, we need to serve only plant-based meals in all government-funded organisations and schools. If not, they will negligently be spending our money to make the climate crisis and our health worse. And point D, those who've been making great profits from taking and misusing the planet's resources need to pay. They haven't been paying for the true cost of of their impact on the planet and they've left the cost for the public to pick up. That needs to stop now. These companies need to give an annual percentage of their income to pay to correct the damage they are responsible for. In our book, Compassion in Commerce, we call this the planet protection percentage. This leads us to our fourth point and another where government inaction has been in the headlines, the water crisis. 
and we've seen an awful lot about that, haven't we? Certainly in the summer of this year with, you know, the sort of record soaring temperatures that we've seen, um, a lot of uh, sort of water shortages, less rainfall. So what is sort of your perspective on the, the, uh, the water crisis as a whole? Well, all life on Earth requires water to thrive and survive. We must treasure it and preserve it for the good of all. Yet we're facing a man-made water scarcity crisis stemming from climate change, pollution and egregious waste. Experts, including the CEO of the Environment Agency, say that London and the southeast of England could run out of water within 25 years and British rivers could lose more than half their water by 2050. That is extremely concerning, isn't it? If you think about sort of the the level of water that currently sort of resides in that part of the country and also the population of that area, that that, that could be a major problem on the horizon for us. Yes, and the water crisis has been made even worse through some extremely poor policy choices. English water companies are more than 90% owned by shareholders abroad, which is outrageous. Water companies are pumping raw sewage into our rivers and seas, wreaking devastation on animals, the environment and human health. And if that isn't enough, there are huge leakage problems. Thames Water, for example, loses almost a quarter of its water this way. The average income for a water company CEO is £1.7 million a year. And the public aren't even able to choose which firm supplies us. Scientists estimate that 50 to 80% of the oxygen production on Earth comes from the ocean. So in killing and polluting our waters, we are killing ourselves. It couldn't be more serious. And I think that's an important fact as well, isn't it? And one that isn't necessarily widely known about, because when we think about sort of oxygen production, certainly in the natural world, I suppose the emphasis, understandably so to an extent, um, is on, you know, things like the Amazon rainforest, for instance, the lungs of the planet. But people aren't necessarily aware that the uh, the benefits of, uh, you know, sort of the uh, the water network within the country or within, within the, the world, rather, that, you know, the oceans, the seas, the sort of the lakes and the rivers that we have. People aren't necessarily aware of that, are they? So that is something that perhaps needs to be more widely known. Selling off our water should have been put to a referendum. The country would never have agreed. Was it even legal? How did that happen under the radar without a referendum? Well, that's that's it, isn't it? I mean, it shouldn't have been allowed to happen, and it's likely that the country would probably never have agreed to it. So given that this is the situation that we're finding ourselves in, um, what do we need to do about that sort of straight away? What can government do about that? Well, point A, there needs to be much more stringent regulation. Why are companies allowed to act in this irresponsible way? Point B, proper enforcement of regulation. It is absolutely farcical that members of the public are having to voluntarily monitor river and beach pollution. And point C, we should also consider renationalisation. This is something that up to 69% of the British public are calling for. Whether that's even possible now that so much is in foreign ownership is going to be tricky to work out. But there may be lessons to learn from the recent great British energy company proposals in that new climate-friendly, publicly-owned companies could be created. And of course, this leads us to our next point five, the UK's self-sufficiency crisis. And again, this is something that a lot has been made of recently, um, and certainly during the uh, the recent Labour Party conference, I know that Sir Keir Starmer picked upon the fact that you know um, energy bills in Swansea, for instance, were being used to build hospitals in Stockholm. I think was a direct quote from him. And we have sold off um, a great amount of not just, of course, our energy resources, but also parts of our industry over the uh, the decades as well. So, um, what are your thoughts on the drivers behind this this particular problem that we're facing now? We, the public, don't own our own water, we don't own our electricity, or our gas, or even our renewable wind energy, we don't own our broadband infrastructure, our rail services, our buses, children's services, our postal service, the list goes on, and a great many of the shareholders of these companies are not British. International trade deals are one thing. Selling off fundamental resources is something else entirely. 
how have successive governments got away with this without pushing it to a public referendum? And how can we prevent this from happening in the future? We are also too dependent on imports. Up to 80% of our food is imported. It's predicted we will need to import 70% of our gas by 2030. And we are dependent on China for critical goods. Now, this is something that is immensely topical, isn't it? Because um, I know, obviously, you mentioned China there, but um, with, of course, the embargoes on sort of Russian oil and gas, that certainly squeezed supplies and really sort of pushed the case for, you know, domestic energy security. Um, But you are right as well. We import um, an awful amount of our food as well. We don't necessarily grow it within our own shores. And uh, what the government needs to do is essentially make sure that we address this head on uh, because there's no more important time to do it. So in your eyes, what steps can ministers take to make sure that happens? Well, here's what needs to happen. Point A, it should be law that our national resources and key infrastructure be owned by the public. And any fundamental decisions regarding national resources should be put to a referendum. Point B, the government needs to support ethical pioneering British companies to help provide the essential goods we need. And point C, we need to adopt new modern models to recognise and enable talent in a broad range of categories. Schools should be one of the first sectors to keep up with the times. But parts of our schooling system are still based on Victorian policies. And again, when we're talking about a period where we're trying to move forward with changing times, the fact that, you know, a lot of what we're doing in education is still rooted in those in those policies, as you say, back for the Victorian times over 100 years ago, that's something that's quite staggering. And I imagine that people aren't really aware of once again. So, um I have to say that this conversation, Judith, has been incredibly enlightening for myself personally so far, and I'm sure the listeners do uh, do share that sentiment. And I know there is more that you'd certainly like to uh, to discuss with us. So moving on to sort of the uh, the next point, uh, what else do you think obviously is something that we should be looking to uh, to really address and what do ministers really need to be prioritising? Point six, the health crisis. With global pandemics, the NHS in serious peril, poor diets, soaring air, water and soil pollution, we must act now to preserve the health of our nation. Alongside supporting our vital NHS with proper investment and management, one of the biggest priorities needs to be encouraging people to keep healthy. Many diseases are preventable and cost the NHS billions, up to 40% of its cost per year. 400 people are diagnosed with preventable cancer every day. 64% of adults are obese or overweight. The use of pesticides, which are implicated in many serious health conditions, is rising. The chemicals applied to the UK's three major crops, which are wheat, onions and potatoes, increased between 600 and 1800% from the 1970s to 2014. And according to the government's own data, air pollution is the largest environmental risk. To public health so we've got major air pollution that we're thinking about here we've got also the increased use of pesticides in the agricultural industry and presumably the horticultural industry as well that's sort of leaking into sort of our diet and affecting uh, sort of our nutrition we've talked about the uh, the nhs there as well and of course the issues that it's facing certainly post-covid um, are very well documented so a lot to sort of look at there So how can we break that down and what needs to be done about those particular issues? Well, many of the measures we've mentioned earlier will help public health, but the government also need to make it much easier for people to be fit and healthy. And point A, that starts with eating well. Numerous studies show that a whole food plant-based diet free from processed foods has massive health benefits. We need to make it easier and cheaper for people to eat this way. New York City, for example, has plant-based meals in schools and has made plant-based meals the default in all of their 11 hospitals. We need to tax companies who provide unhealthy food for the burden they are placing on the NHS. Point B, we must also tackle air pollution as a top priority. Renewable energy, biofuels, planting trees and hemp will help as will the desperate need to clean up the oceans. 
And point C, we need to encourage more exercise, whether that's walking, swimming, yoga, team sports. Martial arts should be available in schools to assist in fitness levels and self-confidence. And daily meditation in schools has been shown to have positive impacts on mental and physical health too. So we talked about the NHS there and we've talked about sort of how we can certainly help from an environmental perspective. But I think it's important to kind of touch on what you said there about exercise as well. I mean, I know that the government was trying to make a real sort of public health push post COVID to, you know, encourage healthier habits and getting people out and walking more because, you know, it, that sort of lowered your risk to sort of diseases like COVID, certainly serious forms of it. And it's interesting as well in there that you also mentioned uh, sort of martial arts as a form of exercise as well, because as well as sort of assisting in your fitness and your self-confidence um it also helps in sort of your self-defense capability and uh that brings us nicely on to what you want to talk about here um and that's um a violence crisis and a real crime crisis let's say that's emerged in this country as well so as you say as a final point let's come to the violence crisis and violence verbal or physical is the lowest form of communication here in the UK, a supposedly advanced nation, we're facing unprecedented levels. When it comes to the people who are supposed to be protecting us, at least 15 serving or former police officers have killed a woman since 2009. One woman a week reports domestic abuse by a police officer. On average, one woman is killed by a man every three days. There has been a 46% increase in knife crime in the past 10 years. There were over a quarter of a million child abuse offences recorded by the police in the year to March 2019. And the RSPCA receives one call every 30 seconds reporting animal cruelty. It's shocking the true scale of the problem, isn't it? And um, I, I know that certainly the, the nation was touched by the uh, the story of uh, Sarah Evra when you talk about, you know, serving and former police officers actually offending and actually committing serious harm and even killing women. It's um, it's an absolute scourge, I have to say. And uh, I know that with uh, with Cher Chevalier, you actually co-created uh, two sort of anti-violence campaigns, didn't you? And that's the uh, the sort of hashtag hands off campaign and also the pause campaign as well just having touched on animal welfare there and uh, both of those were launched with the help of MPs in the House of Commons weren't they so these are campaigns that the government is very much aware about. Yes that's right and here's what needs to happen to help to end violence immediately. Point A ban the sale of more types of dangerous knives for example hunting knives pocket knives and Swiss army knives block the loopholes around already banned weapons such as zombie knives, restrict the online sale of non-cutlery knives. Our gun laws became some of the strictest in the world after the Dunblane tragedy and we now have one of the lowest gun crime rates in the world. We must do the same for knife crime. And most people have absolutely no need for many of the knives that are currently on sale. Some have suggested selling only round-ended knives, while some supermarkets like Asda have restricted the sale of individual knives, but we need to go much further. The law must also be properly enforced. A recent study by Witch found illegal weapons easily available via online retailers for as little as 49 pence. The p- point B... Yeah, the point B, the police and criminal justice systems need serious reform. A challenge indeed, when multiple police officers themselves have been accused or convicted of murder, rape or child abuse. Just this week, Baroness Case's interim report on standards of behaviour and the misconduct process of the Metropolitan Police has confirmed that officers suspected of serious criminal offences, including sexual assault, and domestic abuse have been allowed to escape justice and that radical and wholesale reform of the system is needed. Met Police Chief Sir Mark Rowling has admitted hundreds of officers should be sacked for criminality and misconduct. Dame Vera Baird, the former Victims Commissioner, called for police forces to be compelled to deal with violence against women and girls with the same level of resources, expertise and urgency as terrorism or organised crime. And point C, 
We need to create a society where violence is completely unacceptable. Part of that requires a culture shift. The level of gratuitous violence in film, TV, gaming and the like is so out of control. It needs urgent regulation. We all know that multiple studies show strong links between violent content and violent behaviour. And one US study found that the amount of gun violence in top grossing PG-13 films has more than tripled since 1985. The issues behind the recent case where the coroner ruled that harmful online content contributed to the death of 14-year-old Molly Russell must also be addressed. The British public has been served appallingly by successive governments. We deserve better. We're praying that happens now. Let's start by implementing the solutions we've discussed today so that we as a nation can forge ahead and become bold, brave, booming Britain for the good of all. And it needs to be done on a whole amount of fronts, doesn't it? I think it's fair to say, given the breadth of the issues that we uh, that we have discussed on the uh, the programme today. And uh, I should reach out to, uh, to all listeners uh, tuning into this particular podcast that um, if you... You know, if some of the issues that we have discussed today do particularly resonate with you and you do want to comment on anything that we have said, these are all, of course, verified statistics, by the way, um, you can do so via leaderscouncil.co.uk forward slash contact hyphen us. Um, or you can even apply to be on the programme and add your perspective to the discussion table or on this issue or any other topical matter that you may be passionate about. And that would be via leaderscouncil.co.uk forward slash apply. Um, for now, I have to say it's been immensely thought provoking and eye opening for myself and I'm sure the listeners share that sentiment to welcome Judith Clegg, serial entrepreneur and founder of Takeout onto today's programme. And thank you, Judith, for taking the time, of course, to join us on the uh, the show today. And you know what? I actually think it would be great when we start to see, you know, what this government starts to prioritise to maybe welcome you back onto the programme and just kind of see how far we've come on these various issues that we have discussed today, because I think it is fair to say isn't it that given the severity of the situation that you've outlined on so so many different fronts there needs to be something done now it really does and thank you so much once again for inviting me on it's been my pleasure judith and to everybody listening into the podcast i've been your host scott challoner once more on today's episode and we'll be back next time with a whole new perspective on leadership and current affairs and until then do take care all and goodbye